This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Twilight of the Idols by Friedrich Nietzsche Chapter 9 Skirmishes in a War with the Age Part 2 19 Beautiful and Ugly Nothing is more relative, let us say, more restricted, than our sense of the beautiful. He who would try to divorce it from the delight man finds in his fellows would immediately lose his footing. Beauty in itself is simply a word, it is not even a concept. In the beautiful, man postulates himself as the standard of perfection. In exceptional cases, he worships himself as that standard. A species has no other alternative than to say yea to itself alone in this way. Its lowest instinct, the instinct of self-preservation and self-expansion, still radiates in such sublimities. Man imagines the world itself to be overflowing with beauty. He forgets that he is the cause of it all. He alone has endowed it with beauty. Alas! And only with human, all too human beauty. Truth to tell, man reflects himself in things. He thinks everything beautiful that throws his own image back at him. The judgment, beautiful, is the vanity of his species. A little demon of suspicion may well whisper into the skeptic's ear, Is the world really beautified simply because man thinks it beautiful? He has only humanized it, that is all. But nothing, absolutely nothing, proves to us that it is precisely man who is the proper model of beauty. Who knows what sort of figure he would cut in the eyes of a higher judge of taste? He might seem a little outre, perhaps even somewhat amusing, perhaps a trifle arbitrary. O oh Dionysus, thou divine one, why dost thou pull mine ears? Ariadne asks on one occasion of her philosophic lover during one of those famous conversations on the island of Naxos. I find a sort of humor in thine ears, Ariadne. Why are they not a little longer? 20. Nothing is beautiful. Man alone is beautiful. All aesthetic rests upon this piece of ingeniousness. It is the first axiom of this science. And now let us straightway add the second to it. Nothing is ugly save the degenerate man. Within these two first principles the realm of aesthetic judgments is confined. From the physiological standpoint, everything ugly weakens and depresses man. It reminds him of decay, danger, impotence. He literally loses strength in its presence. The effect of ugliness may be gauged by the dynameter. Whenever man's spirits are downcast, it is a sign that he scents the proximity of something ugly. His feeling of power, his will to power, his courage and his pride, these things collapse at the sight of what is ugly, and rise at the sight of what is beautiful. In both cases, an inference is drawn, the premises to which are stored with extraordinary abundance in the instincts. Ugliness is understood to signify a hint and a symptom of degeneration. That which reminds us, however remotely, of degeneracy impels us to the judgment, ugly. 
every sign of exhaustion, of gravity, of age, of fatigue, every kind of constraint, such as cramp or paralysis, and above all the smells, colors, and forms associated with decomposition and putrefaction, however much they may have been attenuated into symbols, all these things provoke the same reaction, which is the judgment ugly. A certain hatred expresses itself here. What is it that man hates? Without a doubt, it is the decline of his type. In this regard, his hatred springs from the deepest instincts of the race. There is horror, caution, profundity, and far-reaching vision in this hatred. It is the most profound hatred that exists. On its account alone, art is profound. 21. Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer, the last German who is to be reckoned with, who is a European event like Goethe, Hegel, or Heinrich Heine, and who is not merely local, national, is, for a psychologist, a case of the first rank. I mean, as a malicious, though masterly attempt to enlist on the side of a general nihilistic depreciation of life the very forces which are opposed to such a movement. That is to say, the great self-affirming powers of the will to live, the exuberant forms of life itself. He interpreted art, heroism, genius, beauty, great sympathy, knowledge, the will to truth, and tragedy, one after the other as the results of the denial or of the need of the denial of the will. The greatest forgery, Christianity always accepted, which history has to show. Examined more carefully, he is in this respect simply the heir of the Christian interpretation, except that he knew how to approve in a Christian fashion, i.e. nihilistically, even of the great facts of human culture, which Christianity completely repudiates. He approved of them as paths to salvation, as preliminary stages to salvation, as appetizers calculated to arouse the desire for salvation. 22. Let me point to one single instance. Schopenhauer speaks of beauty with melancholy ardor. Why, in sooth, does he do this? Because in beauty he sees a bridge on which one can travel further, or which stimulates one's desire to travel further. According to him, it constitutes a momentary emancipation from the will. It lures to eternal salvation. He values it, more particularly, as a deliverance from the, quote, burning core of the will, unquote, which is sexuality. In beauty, he recognizes the negation of the procreative instinct. Singular saint, Someone contradicts the, I fear it is nature. Why is there beauty of tone, color, aroma, and of rhythmic movement in nature at all? What is it forces beauty to the fore? Fortunately, too, a certain philosopher contradicts him, no less an authority than the divine Plato himself. Thus does Schopenhauer call him. Upholds another proposition, that all beauty lures to procreation, that this, precisely, is the chief characteristic of its effect. From the lowest sensuality to the highest spirituality. 23. Plato goes further, with an innocence for which a man must be Greek and not Christian. He says, that there would be no such thing as Platonic philosophy if there were not such beautiful boys in Athens. 
It was the sight of them alone that set the soul of the philosopher reeling with erotic passion, and allowed it no rest until it had planted the seeds of all lofty things in a soil so beautiful. He was also a singular saint. One scarcely believes one's ears, even supposing one believes Plato. At least one realizes that philosophy was pursued differently in Athens, above all publicly. Nothing is less Greek than the cobweb spinning with concepts by an anchorite, a more intellectualist dei after the fashion of Spinoza. Philosophy according to Plato's style, might be defined rather as an erotic competition, as a continuation and a spiritualization of the old agonal gymnastics and the conditions on which they depend. What was the ultimate outcome of this philosophic eroticism of Plato's? A new art form of the Greek agon, dialectics. In opposition to Schopenhauer and to the honor of Plato, I would remind you that all the higher culture and literature of classical France, as well, grew up on the soil of sexual interests. In all its manifestations you may look for gallantry, the senses, sexual competition, and woman, and you will not look in vain. 24. L'art pour l'art the struggle against a purpose in art is always a struggle against the moral tendency in art, against its subordination to morality. L'art pour l'art means, let morality go to the devil. But even this hostility betrays the preponderating power of the moral prejudice. If art is deprived of the purpose of preaching morality and of improving mankind, it does not by any means follow that art is absolutely pointless, purposeless, senseless. In short, l'art pour l'art, a snake which bites its own tail. No purpose at all is better than a moral purpose, thus does pure passion speak. A psychologist, on the other hand, puts the question, What does all art do? Does it not praise? Does it not glorify? Does it not select? Does it not bring things into prominence? In all this, it strengthens or weakens certain valuations. Is this only a secondary matter, an accident, something in which the artist's instinct has no share? Or is it not rather the very prerequisite which enables the artist to accomplish something? Is his most fundamental instinct concerned with art? Is it not rather concerned with the purpose of art, with life, with a certain desirable kind of life? Art is the great stimulus to life. How can it be regarded as purposeless, as pointless, as l'art pour l'art? There still remains one question to be answered. Art also reveals much that is ugly, hard, and questionable in life. Does it not thus seem to make life intolerable? And, as a matter of fact, there have been philosophers who have ascribed this function to art. According to Schopenhauer's doctrine, the general object of art was to free one from the will, and what he honored as the great utility of tragedy was that it made people more resigned. But this as I've already shown, is a pessimistic standpoint. It is the evil eye. The artist himself must be appealed to. What is it that the soul of the tragic artist communicates to others? Is it not precisely his fearless attitude towards that which is terrible and questionable? This attitude is in itself a highly desirable one. He who has once experienced it honors it above everything else. He communicates it. He must communicate, provided he is an artist and a genius in the art of communication, a courageous and free spirit in the presence of a mighty foe, in the presence of a sublime misfortune, and face to face 
with a problem that inspires horror. This is the triumphant attitude which the tragic artist selects and which he glorifies. The martial elements in our souls celebrate their Saturnalia in tragedy. He who is used to suffering, he who looks out for suffering, the heroic man, extols his existence by means of tragedy. To him alone does the tragic artist offer this cup of sweetest cruelty. 25. To associate in an amiable fashion with anybody, to keep the house of one's heart open to all, is certainly liberal, but it is nothing else. One can recognize the hearts that are capable of noble hospitality by their wealth of screened windows and closed shutters. They keep their best rooms empty. Whatever for? Because they are expecting guests who are somebodies. 26. We no longer value ourselves sufficiently highly when we communicate our soul's content. Our real experiences are not at all garrulous. They could not communicate themselves even if they wished to. They are at a loss to find words for such confidences. Those things for which we find words are things we have already overcome. In all speech there lies an element of contempt. Speech, it would seem, was only invented for average, mediocre, and communicable things. Every spoken word proclaims the speaker vulgarized. Extract from a moral code for deaf and dumb people and other philosophers. 27. Quote, this picture is perfectly beautiful. Unquote. Translator's note. Quotation from the libretto of Mozart's Magic Flute, Act 1, Scene 3. End translator's note. The dissatisfied and exasperated literary woman with a desert in her heart and in her belly listening with agonized curiosity every instant to the imperative which whispers to her from the very depths of her being. Out liberi, out libri. The literary woman, sufficiently educated to understand the voice of nature, even when nature speaks Latin, and moreover enough of a peacock and a goose to speak even French with herself in secret. Je me verrai Je me lirai, je m'exastirai, et je dirai, possible, que j'ai eu ton d'esprit. 28. The objective ones speak. Nothing comes more easily to us than to be wise, patient, superior. We are soaked in the oil of indulgence and of sympathy. We are absurdly just. We forgive everything. Precisely on that account, we should be severe with ourselves. For that very reason, we ought from time to time to go in for a little emotion, a little emotional vice. It may seem bitter to us, and between ourselves, we may even laugh at the figure which it makes us cut. But what does it matter? We have no other kind of self-control left. This is our asceticism, our manner of performing penance. To become personal, the virtues of the impersonal and objective one. 29. Extract from a doctor's examination paper. What is the task of all higher schooling? To make man into a machine. What are the means employed? He must learn how to be bored. How is this achieved? By means of the concept duty. What example of duty has he before his eyes? 
the philologist. It is he who teaches people how to swat. Who is the perfect man? The government official. Which philosophy furnishes the highest formula for the government official? Kant's philosophy. The government official as thing in itself may judge over the government official as appearance. 30. The right to stupidity. The worn-out worker, whose breath is slow, whose look is good-natured, and who lets things slide just as they please. This typical figure which, in this age of labor, and of empire, is to be met with in all classes of society, has now begun to appropriate even art, including the book, above all the newspaper, and how much more so beautiful nature, Italy. This man of the evening, with his savage instincts lulled, as Faust has it, needs his summer holiday, his sea baths, his glacier, his Beirut. In such ages, art has the right to be purely foolish, as a sort of vacation for spirit, wit, and sentiment. Wagner understood this. Pure foolishness is a pick-me-up. 31. Yet another problem of diet. The means with which Julius Caesar preserved himself against sickness and headaches. Heavy marches, the simplest mode of living, uninterrupted sojourns in the open air, continual hardships. Generally speaking, these are the self-preservative and self-defensive measures against the extreme vulnerability of those subtle machines working at the highest pressure, which are called geniuses. 32. The immoralist speaks. Nothing is more distasteful to true philosophers than man when he begins to wish. If they see man only at his deeds, if they see this bravest, craftiest, and most enduring of animals even inextricably entangled in disaster, how admirable he then appears to them, they even encourage him. But true philosophers despise the man who wishes, as also the desirable man, and all the desiderata and ideals of man in general. If a philosopher could be a nihilist, he would be one, for he finds only non-entity behind all human ideals, or not even non-entity, but vileness, absurdity, sickness, cowardice, fatigue, and all sorts of dregs from out the quaffed goblets of his life. How is it that man, who as a reality is so estimable, ceases from deserving respect the moment he begins to desire? Must he pay for being so perfect as a reality? Must he make up for his deeds? for the tension of spirit and will which underlies all his deeds, by an eclipse of his power, in matters of the imagination, and in absurdity. Hitherto, the history of his desires has been the parti en tous of mankind. One should take care not to read too deeply in this history. That which justifies man is his reality, it will justify him to all eternity. How much more valuable is a real man than any other man who is merely the phantom of desires, of dreams, of stinks, and of lies, than any kind of ideal man? And the ideal man, alone, is what the philosopher cannot abide. 33. THE NATURAL VALUE OF EGOISM Selfishness has as much value as the physiological value of him who practices it. 
its worth may be great, or it may be worthless and contemptible. Every individual may be classified according to whether he represents the ascending or the descending line of life. When this is decided, a canon is obtained by means of which the value of his selfishness may be determined. If he represent the ascending line of life, his value is of course extraordinary, and for the sake of the collective life which in him makes one step forward, the concern about his maintenance, about procuring his optimum of conditions, may even be extreme. The human unit, the individual, as the people and the philosopher have always understood him, is certainly an error. He is nothing in himself. No atom, no link in the chain, no mere heritage from the past. He represents the whole direct line of mankind up to his own life. If he represent declining development, decay, chronic degeneration, sickness, illnesses are, on the whole, already the outcome of decline, and not the cause thereof. He is of little worth, and the purest equity would have him take away as little as possible from those who are lucky strokes of nature. He is then only a parasite upon them. 34. The Christian and the Anarchist When the Anarchist, as the mouthpiece of the decaying strata of society, raises his voice in splendid indignation for right, justice, equal rights. He is only groaning under the burden of his ignorance, which cannot understand why he actually suffers, what his poverty consists of, the poverty of life. An instinct of causality is active in him, Someone must be responsible for his being so ill at ease. His splendid indignation alone relieves him somewhat. It is a pleasure for all poor devils to grumble. It gives them a little intoxicating sensation of power. The very act of complaining, the mere fact that one bewails one's lot, may lend such a charm to life that on that account alone one is ready to endure it. There is a small dose of revenge in every lamentation. One casts one's affections, and, under certain circumstances, even one's baseness, in the teeth of those who are different, as if their condition were an injustice, an iniquitous privilege. Since I am a blackguard, you ought to be one too. It is upon such reasoning that revolutions are based. To bewail one's lot is always despicable. It is always the outcome of weakness. Whether one ascribes one's afflictions to others or to one's self, it is all the same. The socialist does the former, the Christian, for instance, does the latter. That which is common to both attitudes, or rather, that which is equally ignoble in them both, is the fact that somebody must be to blame if one suffers. In short, that the sufferer drugs himself with the honey of revenge to allay his anguish. The objects towards which this lust of vengeance, like a lust of pleasure, are directed, are purely accidental causes. In all directions the sufferer finds reasons for cooling his petty passion for revenge. If he is a Christian, I repeat, he finds these reasons in himself. The Christian and the anarchist both are decadents. But even when the Christian condemns, slanders, and sullies the world, he is actuated by precisely the same instinct as that which leads the socialistic workman to curse, calumniate, and cast dirt at society. The last judgment itself, is still the sweetest solace to revenge. Revolution, 
as the socialistic workman expects it, only thought of as a little more remote. The notion of a beyond as well. Why a beyond, if it be not a means of splashing mud over a here, over this world? 35. A Criticism of the Morality of Decadence An altruistic morality, a morality under which selfishness withers, is in all circumstances a bad sign. This is true of individuals, and above all of nations. The best are lacking when selfishness begins to be lacking. Instinctively to select that which is harmful to one, to be lured by disinterested motives. These things almost provide the formula for decadence. Not to have one's own interests at heart. This is simply a moral fig leaf concealing a very different fact, a physiological one, to wit, I no longer know how to find what is to my interest. Disintegration of the instincts. All is up with man when he becomes altruistic. Instead of saying ingeniously, I am no longer any good, the lie of morality in the decadence mouth says, Nothing is any good. Life is no good. A judgment of this kind ultimately becomes a great danger, for it is infectious, and it soon flourishes on the polluted soil of society with tropical luxuriance, now as a religion, Christianity, anon as a philosophy, Schopenhauerism. In certain circumstances, the mere effluvia of such a venomous vegetation, springing as it does out of the very heart of putrefaction, can poison life for thousands and thousands of years. End Part 2 Chapter 9 This recording is in the public domain.